I'm very happy to welcome uh, Professor Sriram Krishnamurthy today. I'm sorry if I mispronounced. No, you're doing great. Thank you. <laughs> uh, Sriram uh, is a professor of computer science at Brown University, an Ivy League university in the US. And um, he says that uh, his head is usually in formal methods and in other uh, domains like networking and uh, uh, security, but his uh, heart is in uh, programming languages. And uh, for, for the last uh, past uh, five years, uh, he uh, became very interested in computer science education. And actually, I have met, uh, I have seen Sriram talk uh, the first time in 2019 when we had the formal methods conference in Porto. Uh, and uh, it was a very, very nice talk. And um, I'm very, very eager to see what he will uh, talk about today. He, we, we had, uh, of course, uh, an exchange of emails and uh, he says that he would like to talk about uh, using uh, property-based testing as, uh, uh, as a way of getting to writing formal specifications. But his precise title is from tests to properties, uh, property-based testing. something, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it, it was a preliminary test uh, title That's at some right. point, yeah. That's right. So um, we are very happy to have you here, Sriram. So uh, please go ahead whenever you are ready. Thank you so much. It's it's uh, it's delightful to be here. Uh, uh, thank you for organizing this event. I think it's wonderful. We need more of this sort of formal methods education. I think it's particularly timely. Uh, I do want to say that uh, you know a lot of the work I've done here has been work, it's really joint work with Tim Nelson, who's also on this call. He's going to run off to teach actually in a little while, but he's here. <laughs> okay. And some of the work is collaborative with our PhD student Elijah Rivera, who's also here. But I'm also uh, excited to see some people I haven't seen in a while, like you know people like Jack Willardin are on this call. Ihe is over here, so there's lots of old friends as well and new friends. So uh, good to see all of you here. Um, the, I, I like to keep things very informal. So at any time you have a question, you don't have to wait for the end. The point is this isn't even meant to be like a hour long presentation or anything like that. Jump in whenever you can. I kind of have a screen configuration where I can sort of see chat and sort of see raised hands. But uh, I, uh, I think also uh, Luigi will let me know if uh, something comes yes. up that I, that I miss. Okay. Okay. So um, uh, I want to talk about something that is very fundamental to formal methods, which is the notion of a property. Right? We all know that properties are critical for things like you know, verification. If you don't have a property, what are you even going to verify? There's nothing there to verify. Um, but I think, uh, am I still uh, audible, by the way? Yeah. Okay, good. Uh, my screen froze for a little. Okay, so um, we know that they're critical, but I think they're only becoming more and more important. Right? We have now an increasing set of synthesis tools. Uh, we're talking about reliability of AI systems, all kinds of important questions now coming up, which also depend upon us having properties. Right? And yet I feel like uh, uh, for many of us, not all of you obviously, but for many of us, properties have actually been a neglected part of programming education. And one important question for me is, how do we get students to think in terms of properties? Okay, so that's, that's where I'm trying to go in this presentation, right? Uh, Luigi, can you please confirm everything is still working okay? I was muted. Everything is fine on my end, at least. Wonderful. Okay. Yeah. So in what I want to talk about, I want to uh, tell you about a principle, an educational principle that I've been trying to follow for about uh, 20 years now, uh, which I will call the 90% uh, the principle. And what I mean by this is in the classes that we teach, there's about 10% of the students who are exactly like us, right? They're sort of the, the academics in the making, right? And you can sort of teach them almost anything. They're very excited about the most abstract thing you can teach them, the most detailed thing you can teach them and so on. But what that also means is there's this other 90% that are not like us, that are not going on to the same career path or don't think they are anyway. And they need at least as much of our attention. In fact, you know, they're not going to become academics. They're the ones that are going to go off and become practitioners. They're going to implement systems in big companies. They're the ones whose work we're all going to be using on a daily basis. And so the question for me is always, how do I reach that other 90% who will not accept anything that I give them just because I gave it to them, but actually need to be motivated by what I'm talking about? 
Okay. And so a goal, I think, in our educational system should be to meet the students where they are and bring them along with us rather than just saying, we're standing over here and it's your responsibility to get there somehow. And if you don't, you know, well, you really, maybe you're not cut out for this or something like that. I think, uh, you know, we have some harmful notions in our education sometimes, and I want us to get past those. Okay. So what I'm going to be talking about is a little bit is about course content at uh, my university, which is Brown. Um, and I'm not going to go into the details of these very much at all, but I'm going to be drawing on things from three different courses, uh, sort of an introductory course, but it's an accelerated one for students coming in with some computer science background, an intermediate level software engineering course, and then the upper level form of its class that uh, originally Tim and I co-designed, but Tim has been teaching for the past 10 years, and it's really his course now, that's called Logic for Systems. And even in the vocabulary, you can kind of tell it's a applied logic course. It's logic that's driven around the needs of computing systems systems rather than logic for its own sake, right? So, so it's, it's very uh, systems oriented in its perspective. Okay, so this is the course context in which I'm going to talk. And what I want to do now is I want to start by talking about a, a kind of learning progression here, right? Um, and in general, uh, we find that many, many times when it comes to programming and comes to verification and so on, uh, there's this sort of rough graph we can draw, right? Of things that are uh, power, sort of on two axes, one is how powerful they are, and the other is how relatively easy they are to get uh, to adopt, right? And oftentimes, you will find things that sort of sit in some, somewhere along this sort of uh, principal diagonal, right? Obviously, we have no interest at all in things that are not powerful and hard, right? Um, and it would be wonderful if we had things that were very powerful and easy, but that's, uh, that's pretty rare, right? So things tend to sit somewhere along this, right? And the question is, you know, if we have to get from a point, one point in the space to the other point in the space, oftentimes the jump is too big. And the question is, can we find intermediate points in the space that let us make smaller jumps and make incremental progress? Okay, so that's a very abstract picture. Very concretely, um, in this particular presentation, what I'm interested in as an endpoint is getting us to writing full formal properties, right? They're very powerful. They encompass like, you know, a very rich statement about a system, uh, but arguably they're not easy for students to do early on and we have to ease them into it. So where do we start? You know, so I've got this dot at the bottom left of this graph. And uh, I'm gonna say something that some of you will find controversial, which is that uh, I view unit tests as being on this spectrum. Meaning I think of unit tests as also being a specification, in fact, a somewhat formal specification of a system. It's the difference between specification from above, where you're describing all the possible behaviors, and that necessarily is a very abstract statement, and specification from below, where you're still stating the behaviors you expect, but you can only describe a finite number of them, but you can be extremely concrete as a result. Right, And I'm interested in this question of how do we sort of get these two viewpoints to eventually meet up? So, so my, maybe my controversial statement here is unit tests are specifications too. Um, they're of a somewhat different form, but they're still getting students to start thinking about systems as abstract behaviors rather than only as concrete implementations. Okay? And so now the question, of course, as you can guess from, uh, from the abstract and from the introduction, is my intermediate point that I want to talk about is property-based testing. As a point that sits between these two, it's more powerful than unit tests, a little harder to write, less powerful than fully formal properties, and maybe a little easier to get used to. And that's what I want to talk about. Okay. All right. So now we're going to do, there's going to be audience participation. Um, unfortunately, my screen seems to have frozen a little bit. So I have to figure out what I can do to uh, restore that. But here's the, actually, maybe you can unmute and just speak then. Um, and uh, maybe Luja can, can, uh, can coordinate that. So here is the question for you, right? What is your favorite example or what are your favorite examples of property-based testing? Go. Any uh, ideas, answers, thoughts? I'm not hearing anything, Luigi. Is that because nobody is speaking or because there's a Zoom problem? There is uh, something in the chat. Um, in invariance. Ah. In okay, but that's not an example, right? That's, uh, that's, you've replaced one abstract statement with another abstract statement. No, it's a property that you test. Th that's right, but what is the concrete example? A sorting function sorts. 
Sorting function sorts. Great. Okay. Other examples? Thank you. There are BS trees and Scala check in the chat. Okay, great. If you, are you looking for tools or a particular actual example? I want, I want specific domains that we use to motivate students. You know, quick check, blue check. Those are tools, not domains. Yeah, I think that the encoding, decoding properties are relatively nice. Oh, very uh, nice. Simple. Very nice. Very nice. Okay, run length very encoding. Nice. Excellent. Others? Okay. So these are good examples. Um, I, uh, the sorting one will come up again in a moment. I think the encoding, decoding is a really great example. Can uh, I add, can I add protocols are, uh, to that? Protocols, like, okay. uh, like bus protocols in hardware. Right, right. Bus protocols are maybe a little, uh, depending on their student sophistication, could be extremely accessible. Absolutely. Okay, good. So let me, uh, let me uh, talk a little bit about how PPT is traditionally presented. And I'm going to do this for you in a pair of tweets. Um, so here's Julia Evans, who's a very uh, popular writer about uh, systems. And, uh, you know, here's her comment, right? I feel like when I often when I see examples of PPT, there's a lot of toy examples of functions like math.abs that I find hard to relate my actual code to, right? And now here's one from um, uh, David McIver, who's the author of Hypothesis, which is one of the most widely used PPT systems out there, right? It says, every time someone uses reversing a list twice to demonstrate PPT, I take a drink. No, this isn't a drinking game. I'm just being driven to drink by bad examples. And what he says specifically is, yes, let's make our founding and most prevalent example a non-generalizable property of a function that's very hard to get wrong. What a great idea, right? So, so there is a dearth. And so, uh, you know, there are some good examples here today. And, but in general, there's a dearth of good examples for motivating this problem and also for convincing students that this is a thing that they should be trying to do, okay? So what I wanna talk about now is the approach that has seemed to work very well for us and uh, tell you to present it slightly in the abstract and then go to concrete examples, okay? So here is the way that I've been approaching this for many years now, which is we start with, the, we, we start with them being familiar with unit testing. And it's important to know that unit testing is not a hard thing to sell students on because they understand that this is an authentic industrial practice, right? Remember, I'm talking about the other 90% of the students who need to be convinced about things, right? They acknowledge that it's an industrial practice. In fact, the students who go and spend a summer internship in industry and come back to college are even more convinced because they've had to do it. And they're like, yep, that's just what we do. Okay, so we understand unit testing. And now we run into the following issue. So there's a unit test you run and it fails. Why does it fail? Well, you know, we know what's gonna happen, right? The test is correct and the code is incorrect. So you found a bug in your program. Congratulations, testing did its job. Uh, not always, right? Occasionally you find the case that actually the code is what was correct and the test was incorrect. And you have to figure out like how you can understand like, oh, I actually wrote essentially the wrong specification, okay? And we can talk a lot more about this particular setting in a educational programming setting, but that's not the purpose of today's talk. Um, occasionally, of course, both are incorrect. It can happen, doesn't happen very often perhaps. Um, but the much more intriguing prospect, the much more intriguing case is when both are actually correct. So what does it even mean to have had a failure in this case? Well, the problem is that the problem statement allows a particular input to produce many possible answers. You wrote your test unit test. Remember, it's a very concrete thing. You wrote it for one answer and you got a different answer. And now the answer is not wrong. It's just different, okay? So um, between us, these are problems that I call relational problems for obvious reasons, right? What we might have thought was a function is actually a relation. and this has a very nice element of sort of like surprise and shock, right? When this happens, students stop and say, wait, what's going on? And it sort of has this tendency to sort of disrupt their universe, right? Like, I wasn't expecting this to happen. This doesn't make sense. Oh, actually it makes sense. Oh, there's something more going on here and I need to think about it more broadly, okay? So <clears throat> when they run into this, uh, what we've noticed is the initial student instinct is to, well, just write the test as a disjunction of po po possibilities, right? So you know, I could have like a square root function. I could just list, enumerate all the possibilities. And now I'm back to being in a, in a sort of space I understand and it's back to being a unit test. So the critical thing is you need to push them to a space where this simply is not gonna scale. They can't enumerate all the inputs. And once they can't enumerate the inputs, they have no choice but to think about a different technique for dealing with the problem, okay? so. Here are three uh, example problems that we have studied in a lot of detail. When I say studied, you'll understand what I mean in the second half of the talk. Um, 
So you can start with something as simple. So this is something that I do in the fourth week, not even fourth week, maybe the third week of my introductory programming class. So these are students who have been in college for three weeks, right? It's, a, it's an accelerated class, but still the idea of structured data, once you can add enough structure to the data, already there's no you know, canonical sort ordering and you can start to introduce notions like stability and instability of sorting. And now we suddenly realize that there are many possible answers. And so one, the sort is not a function, sort is actually a relation, okay? Um, Going on, it's actually a very interesting idea to think about testing a program you don't know how to implement yet. So we use stable marriage for that. It's a graph algorithm that they have not yet seen. Again, this is in week four of their first semester in college. So they can't even think about an implementation. The only thing they can think about talking about is like the input output relationship and then describing that as a, as a, as a function because it can't be done concretely because of course there can be many possible stable marriages. And then you get to problems like topological sorting. Again, you can start to see the sort of relational flavor to the problem where one input can have multiple possible outputs. And if you try to write concrete examples, you're going to get a problem, right? So these are early examples that we've been using for motivating this idea of property-based testing. And there are actually many, many, many more problems like this that appear quite naturally. So um, most of the problems I'm listing here are actually problems that I do in my introductory class. And after they've seen the first uh, two, the sorting of structured data and stable marriage, the seed gets planted in their heads that, oh, Sometimes I can use concrete tests and sometimes I cannot use concrete tests. And so for the rest of the semester, there are actually several of these problems that require some notion of property-based testing. And I don't have to tell them that because they start to sense that, oh, is this gonna be one of these problems where there's not a canonical output? And I'm gonna have to, oh, I see. I'm gonna have to do that thing, right? And we call it oracles. And so they say, I'm gonna have to build an oracle, am I not? Yes, you are. And so it becomes an instinctive thing for them by the end of the semester to start writing property-based tests for all these kinds of problems, okay? Um, there's another kind of motivation that also shows up, which is the idea that you might have two different implementations of the same problem. And uh, there are many kinds of settings where this can happen. Uh, you know, so you might have like either a slow and a fast implementation of the same problem, or there could just be multiple strategies, maybe multiple algorithmic techniques for the same problem. So examples of this, you, you might have set implementations where you have like a list-based set, and then you have a tree-based set. Um, you might have, you know, like this is actually, again, an assignment in my course. We do a minimum spanning tree using two different algorithms, Kruskal and the Yadnik prim algorithm. So again, you have two different implementations. Uh, one example that uh, Tim does in his uh, intermediate software engineering course is talking about nearest neighbors. And that's a case where, again, there's a, there's a simple uh, linear scan of all of the points. And then you can start thinking about how you break down the space and do a more optimized geometric search. And so again, you want to make sure that you have a property-based test because the linear scan and the, the more efficient scan are not going to give you the same things, right? And it's interesting here that two of these problems, the MST and the nearest neighbors, are again of this relational flavor. The set one is not really of a relational flavor necessarily. It depends on how you define the sets, right? So this, this idea of relational problems has become a pervasive idea in my courses and also now in the logic for systems class. And we get to use this very nice progression where we start students in unit tests, we hit this problem with unit testing. So we start with a very authentic problem. They know like everyone understands the need for unit tests. We move to this place where the thing that you agree is valuable is still valuable, but problematic that motivates the need for a new technique that then becomes the generalization of the previous technique. And from there, we start getting students thinking in terms of these properties. Okay? So in the programming courses, we stop with property-based testing. But as I said, uh, we have this course called Logic for Systems, where of course, that's just the starting point, right? This is like the first week of Logic for Systems to get students thinking in terms of properties, but we have to now migrate them out of properties and thinking bigger than that. Right? So there we start with unit tests and property-based testing. Eventually the course is going, going to go on to doing alloy uh, model checking with one or different uh, model checkers, maybe some deductive verification and so on, sort of a full-blown formal methods class. Right? So there we have this task we need to solve, which is we've gotten students thinking about property-based testing about programs. Now we have to get them to thinking about properties of formal specifications. And again, there's a transition path that we need over there. And for us, a transition path that's worked particularly well is to talk about um, well-formedness properties of systems. 
So once you make the migration from programs to a system like Alloy, uh, Alloy, by the way, I assume most people here know Alloy, but Alloy is essentially uh, first order logic with transitive closure uh, and it uh, with domain bounds, and it automatically maps down to SAT solver and you use a SAT solver. So students don't have to do things deductively. They do things through sort of, it feels a little bit like programming, right? They, they click a run and a SAT solver runs and produces counterexamples. So now when they start modeling things in Alloy, uh, they run into this problem that Alloy is, you know, a SAT solver is going to explore the entire space and it's going to produce all kinds of things that you might think of as sort of nonsensical or garbage, right? So they start with an example like tic-tac-toe and you start with row and column being an integer, but then of course it's going to produce all kinds of integers that you really didn't want. And then you can talk about refining from integers to natural numbers to very specifically the values zero, one, and two, which are the only valid values you want for the row and column, right? Or similarly, you want to know that the number of X's and the number of O's, the difference is like, you know, no more than one, right? So these are things where if you don't state it, Alloy will show you all these possibilities and you have to somehow state these to sort of bound the space of what Alloy produces. So in Alloy, there's a very nice distinction in what are called facts and what are called properties. Uh, you know, it's sometimes like it's like similar to properties versus environment constraints and so on. Like that, there's, you know, analogs to this in every formal methods world. Um, and so facts are things that are just true. You will not see any instances that don't match the facts. Properties are things that may or may not be true and actually have to be checked, right? That's the distinction. And um, it's a, you know, Tim has this very nice vocabulary where he calls these garbage versus bad behavior, right? Facts are things that are just garbage. You don't even want to know about them, but you don't want to make too many things facts because then you'll rule out things that your system might have done that you should have been checking for and that might in fact be erroneous. And so properties are things that could be bad, could be good. Um, you, well, you know that you want it to be good, but the system may or may not exhibit it. Right? So uh, the fact that rows and columns should be zero, one, and two, that's just a fact. We're not even interested in row and column being minus 17. Uh, but the possibility that the number of X's and O's might be, you know, might be off, that's a thing that's a property because once you model the dynamics of the system, you wanna check that you got the dynamics modeling correct so that you actually stay within that bound. Now, the very nice thing, remember, the point of this talk is to talk about the transition path and property-based testing as the midpoint, is that these two parts correspond very nicely with something that you already run into in property-based testing, which is that the well-formedness facts correspond to what you want the generator to exhibit, right? You want the generator to only exhibit, produce things that are not garbage, right? That corresponds to the facts. But then you also have a predicate and that's the behavioral property that you want to check. And that might be true or false. So you don't want to rule those out. You want to actually do that as a check. So the thing is, by the time they get to a system like Alloy or they get to a model checker, they have to write environment constraints and so on. They're already very well primed with this idea that there are both garbage things and bad behavior things, and they are handled separately and in different parts of the system. And they have to think about which thing is which whenever they are going to be working with, uh, you know, formal method stores, right? And so what uh, we found is that well-formedness is a very good gateway to thinking about richer behavioral properties of systems, okay? Um, that's the first part of the talk. That's the part where I wanted to talk about the pedagogic approach and I'm happy to pause here. I, if there were questions, I assume I would have been told, but I'm also happy to pause here for a moment and uh, see if people have questions. And if not, I mean, I've got plenty of time at the end also for questions, but I'm happy to pause now if anyone wants to bring something up that's pressing. I don't have a chat channel, so I'm afraid somebody will have to read out for me or uh, 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 let me know if I can continue. The chat is uh, good, so it doesn't have any questions okay. at this point. Okay, very good. So let me go on then. All right. So what I want to do next is I want to talk about how we evaluate student performance. Okay. So uh, in the problems that we give them, we ask students to decompose the task into two parts. One is generating the inputs and the other is validity checking. And, uh, and we do this decomposition on purpose because in some cases uh, we actually ask in the introductory class, I actually, I asked students to generate input, write the generate input function as well to give them a feel that this isn't, you know, there's not like just a black box that's doing something magical. Uh, in the more advanced classes, they use this hypothesis tool to do the input generation. But either way we want them to write is valid. And remember that is valid is the actual property statement, right? So that's the thing where we want to actually, that's the thing we want to evaluate. Are they doing well? Are they understanding properties? That's the part we need to evaluate, okay? So what is is valid? Well, is valid is basically gonna consume an input output pair. 
So this was the input to the function. This was the output from the function. And it has to come back and either bless them or not bless them, right? It has to come back and say, yes, that's a perfectly reasonable uh, tuple in the relation, so to speak, in our terms. And, or to come back and say, no, that's not a reasonable tuple in the relation, right? So it comes back and returns a Boolean based on validity. That's the part we need to, we need to figure out how well students are doing. So, you know, it's an easy way to do this, right, is valid is basically it's a binary classifier. So we can think about this in terms of precision and recall. Um, the problem with that is it doesn't give us any sort of semantic insight into how students are doing, right? It might come back and give us a pair of numbers, but we don't know why students are failing, where they're failing, what kinds of weaknesses they have. Not all weaknesses are the same. Are they making a certain kind of mistake more than some other kind of mistake? We want some insight into that, right? So the idea that we've been using, which will be fairly natural to, I think, people on this call, is we take the property and split it up into a collection of conjuncts, okay? And we want to check each of these conjuncts separately. So, for example, in the sorting example, as somebody mentioned at the beginning, uh, you can take, you know, three sub-properties might be that all the same, uh, the input-output have to be the same size, they have to have the same elements, and the output has to be ordered relative to the input, right, or just has to be ordered, right? Um, if you have something like topological sorting, again, you get same elements and ordering and maybe no duplicates. Uh, stable marriage, you want to talk about, you know, breaking it down to stability and, you know, there's, uh, you know, sort of one-to-one -one onto and then uh, everybody was probably paired, et cetera. Okay. So you can break it down into these sub-properties and each of these sub-properties is something where you can actually use, you know, if we've used both alloy to generate instances and we've used hypothesis to generate concrete instances. And uh, there's actually some work we've done to try to compare these two and how well they fare against each other. Um, the point being that you can generate instances and test for each of these properties independently. And that now gives us a sense of how students are doing. So for example, you can, you can, you know, you can look at the Venn diagram of these things and you can see, so, so this is a, you know, sort of slightly, uh, maybe slightly garishly colorful picture, but you can look at every subset of these and ask, you know, are students failing in these subsets? So in this particular case, for example, we can see that like, you know, one of these things, the same, you know, it's not the same elements, 30 students are actually failing that property, right? Um, 11 students are failing the same size property, only three students are failing the ordering property, uh, and then there are some people who are also in the intersection, and then this question about relational functional, we can talk about separately if you're interested, it's basically like a baseline admissions criterion. So we can get some semantic insight into which things students are struggling with more and which things students are struggling with less, right? The fact that they're getting ordering wrong sounds pretty problematic from a set point of view, uh, but clearly if we want to like make sure they really understand, you know, that, that we want to pick the low hanging fruit, it's probably the same elements thing. And in particular, the point here is not so much to judge the students, but to take this kind of output and compare it against the course pedagogy, right? What we're really evaluating is not students, but evaluating ourselves as the instructors. We're evaluating whether we, you know, this, was there something wrong in the way we taught them to think about this? What are the things, how are the ways we have to change the course and adapt the course if these are the mistakes they're making as opposed to those are the mistakes they're making? So what kinds of misconceptions are they having, right? This has been a very useful tool for us in that regard. Okay. So the last thing I want to do is to talk about what I think of as some of the open issues in thinking about this, uh, this, this pathway for getting students into formal methods in a gradual way. Um, the first is, uh, how do we come up with these sub-properties? Well, you know, it's obvious we can think hard. Um, we can also look at prior student mistakes, right? So one of the nice things is if you start to do this over the years, uh, you build up longitudinally a data set of what students are doing, and you can stare at the student mistakes and try to turn those into sub-properties and uh, uh, essentially take each of their failures and uh, essentially it's kind of regression testing, right? Re regression testing is you have some failure in your program, you take that failure and encode it as a test to make sure that you don't have that failure again in your program. Well, so essentially it's the same principle here. We take the student failure, we turn it into a test and see if future students still have it. Hopefully we've adapted our pedagogy so it no longer becomes a problem, but it also helps us signal if we have not done so successfully. And the third thing you can do is you can actually use uh, sort of like a crowdsourcing kind of process. I like to call it class sourcing because they're going to go to the students to generate misconceptions. Uh, this is a very powerful idea that we're starting to explore. Uh, we have a system that helps us do this and uh, basically uses a, a, a sort of a bandit process to help us uh, prioritize and work with students to generate uh, misconceptions in a variety of fields. And we're starting to use this in formal methods as well. Okay. Next question. How formal are their property-based testing properties? Uh, and it actually depends a little bit on what kind of language and what kind of programming style. 
So in the two classes that do it the most, uh, we have some classes that use uh, this language called Pirate, uh, which is something we've been building. It's a mostly functional thing like, you know, scheme or camel kind of language. Uh, and the other class uh, uses Python uh, and there's no constraints on what kind of features students are allowed to use. And what we've generally found is that the resulting properties in Pirate code can look somewhat logical. They're sort of functional code and there's somewhat a compositional feel to something that's to some of the things that students write. And the Python code, it tends to be a little bit more of an anything goes. And so bringing back to this picture that I put up, uh, this sort of the pseudo graph that I do at the beginning of the talk, um, I think what this shows is there's actually several points on the path to formality. There's everything from just, I'm thinking about properties versus I'm actually expressing properties in a logical way. Right. And, and so there's actually many points in this progression and it's worth maybe digging deeper and uh, looking at that progression more. Um, next thing is, uh, as I said, we use this property decomposition for assessment of the student work. And if actually, as I said, really assessment of the curriculum. Um, but the question is, is this also perhaps a useful pedag pedagogic tool? Right? Could we teach students to think about the world in this way? This is a thing we've been discussing, but we haven't done much work on yet. Uh, and specifically, I think there's a very powerful analogy and maybe more than an analogy to this idea of planning in programming education, right? There's a, there's, there was a lot of interesting work on this in the 80s and it fell out of favor. And we're trying to revive this work right now. In particular, Elijah and I are doing a bunch of work in this space right now and thinking about how to you know, get students to solve harder problems by being able to do decomposition of their tasks. And so there's a lot of good cognitive science literature out there on this problem that has not, to my knowledge, been applied at all in formal methods. And I think this may be an interesting way to start to do that kind of application. Okay. Last thing I want to say is uh, I want to exhort this community. So, you know, I identify as a formal methods person quite a bit, uh, even though my PhD was in programming languages, I, I kind of minored in Moshe Vardy is how I like to talk, call it. I took every course he offered and when I was a grad student uh, working with him. And uh, so I feel very a strong kinship to the formal methods community. Uh, but uh, as Lou just said at the beginning for the past 10 years, actually I've been mostly uh, doing, about half of my research has really been computing education research not just education, but education research. And I feel there's a bit of a disconnect in the way the FM community still approaches education. Uh, I'm gonna really uh, irritate some people now by giving you a sort of caricature of what I see in some of our uh, formal methods education papers. And, and to explain how I feel about it, uh, let, me, let me give you an analogy, right? Imagine that you had just built a new SAT solver, right? You have a great shiny new SAT solver. And let's imagine this is the evaluation section of your paper, right? You say, okay, we're gonna evaluate it. What did we do? Well, we ran it, it's really nice. Our students told us they liked it. Uh, one of our colleagues said it looked pretty good too. Uh, good, so it was great, moving on, future work, right? This is frankly the field to some of our education papers. And there is a whole body of literature out there on and a whole body of techniques and methods and so on about how to do better for education. And I think I would love to see this community uh, is capable of it. And some of you do it and some of you don't. And I'd love to see the community move past this point of like extremely weak anecdotal evidence, okay? And I want to conclude by telling you that all the stuff that I talked about today isn't contained in two papers. Uh, I believe Luigi is going to add a link to those papers to the uh, uh, the uh, uh, the uh, formal methods teaching site, so you can find them there later on. So um, I will end with this. And my goal was to have a short talk, so we can have plenty of time for questions. Uh, I have ended now, so all the rest of the time, as long as you want to talk, is open for questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Riram. Very interesting. Uh, while people so, think uh, about comments and criticisms and whatever else, I will try to get my Zoom uh, chat uh, visible to me again. Uh, let's see. I tried to do something with an external monitor and it's clearly failed miserably for me. So <laughs> let me see if I can undo that. Uh, okay, so comments, questions, anything at all, please go ahead and uh, let's just use the audio channel for now till I get the chat window visible again. I was just curious uh, how big your courses are. Uh, you you yeah, mentioned so, these three courses. Yeah, so I mean, uh, the, the, uh, anywhere from um, 70 to about uh, 200 plus. 
Now, I mean, if you have to put those numbers in context, uh, Brown University is not a very large university by U.S. standards. So, uh, you know, U.S. universities are, go from anywhere from about 3,000 students to about uh, 60,000 students or more. Uh, Brown is at about 6,000 students, so it's very much on the small end of the U.S. range. Uh, it, so so uh, 200 students is actually an enormous class by Brown standards. Uh, but, but, you know, as some of you probably know, I'm sure it's true in some other, in some of your countries, but maybe not all of them, uh, CS has had this massive explosion of enrollment uh, where, you know, about a third of the university takes some computer science, about six of the university now majors in computer science. So, so we have some scaling issues to think about here. So these are also uh, these are also things. This is also, I think, part of what motivates us, right? Is when when computer science, when we had thirty majors, uh, most of those were sort of you know quote unquote hardcore students. Now, of course, they were not a very diverse group at all, um, which was definitely a problem. But they were already hardcore students, and they did they kind of didn't need much persuading about various computer science aspects. I think what's wonderful about this growth is that we have a lot of students with a lot of very different backgrounds, uh, many of whom have never considered computer science before. Many of them start computer science, maybe one or even two years into college and are scrambling to catch up and try to finish a major. Maybe they have some outside interest, their main interest is something else. They're doing computer science kind of as a secondary major. Trying to get those students to buy into things like property-based testing or formal methods is a very, very, very different task than taking students who've been, I don't know, programming since they were 14 or something like that. I mean, they have their own challenges, but they are sort of maybe dual challenges, but they all produce different kinds of challenges. And one of the nice things about having this very broad spectrum of students is you're forced to confront how you can meaningfully talk to all of them, right? Um, you can't just assume that they'll naturally come along. Okay, I think I seem to have my Zoom restored. So uh, people can write into chat, people can ask questions verbally, uh, whatever. I'm also curious to hear from, you know, part of what I'm, I'm here to learn from others as well, uh, not to be some sort of authority standing on a hill. So I'm curious to hear what uh, other people here do. How do you get students the point of appreciating and being able to effectively write properties? Tell me what you do. Uh, yeah, she's, go ahead. Alberto, go ahead, please. You are muted, muted Alberto. Alberto. Yeah. Okay. My question has to do with the idea of uh, splitting the property into a collection of conjuncts. Uh, I think, it, uh, if I understand correctly, that uh, you try to uh, split a large property into smaller properties and try to prove each of those parts independently. I would suggest, uh, I want to ask you but why you pick up the, uh, say, end con uh, uh, conjunctions. You could, uh, why not split it in ors or, put it, or in implication? And then I answer myself this question. This is like writing in a prologue or in, in a horn closes. You have a conjunction of implications. Correct. So, uh, uh, have you ever thought about splitting your big property into a collection of conjunctions of implications? Because, anyway, a small property will be valid only upon some uh, hypothesis. Thank you. Uh, sure. Uh, Tim, would you like to join in before you have to leave? Or so. If it's okay, I so so I think I certainly haven't thought of splitting into ORs because our work so far, I think, is focused on catching situations where students have missed pieces of the overall property. And so we're trying to catch sort of students who have satisfied, you know, nine sub properties but failed one of them. And so in that setting, conjunction seems quite natural. Something we haven't looked at yet is students who might be over constraining in their property. And I think your suggestion might be an interesting way to go there. Thank you. Right. I mean, it's also important to remember that the way we're using the sub properties is we're not proving something of a system. We are using the sub properties to assess the work that the students turned in, right? So we have some overarching system and we have some uh, property of, uh, I don't know, sortedness or topological sortedness. And that's what the students are just thinking about the big picture. What does it mean to be topologically sorted? Right? How do I how do I test to make sure that something is topologically sorted? They turn in that property, and we want to know you 
there are many ways in which you can get topological sorting not completely right, right? So you could get it completely wrong, right? If I give this input and this output and they're just not in the relation and you say they are, that's just completely wrong, right? But you might miss some subtle sub-properties. So you get it right sometimes and you get it wrong sometimes. So now what are the, what are the cases you get right and what are the cases you don't get right? Right. So, so for example, you know, going back to the sort, you know, very simple example sorting, right? We want to know that all the input elements were in the output and all the output elements were also in the input, right? And sometimes students forget to check that in both directions. So I want to know what are the ways in which you might not have thought about some subcondition, right? And that's the specific thing we're trying to check for here. So when Tim says nine out of 10, right, that's kind of what we mean. There's a whole bunch of things. You got mostly right, but you didn't get it all right. And I can give you a grade and I can say you got 90%, but I want some semantic insight into what you missed. Because now if I start to find that half of the class is missing something, one student misses something, maybe, you know, I give them some individual feedback. But if I find a third of the class or half the class is missing some sub-property, then that suggests there's some systematic misunderstanding in the class. And that suggests how I should change the way I teach the class or something like that. Right. Thank you. So I think your question is a very interesting one and neither Tim nor I had thought about that before, uh, but I think it has a maybe different use than the one we are currently thinking of. And what we should really do is think about how we can use your idea. So thank you. Thank you for giving that idea, Alberto. Wolfram, please go ahead. Hi. Uh, do you give students opportunities to, or do you guide them to explore the consequences of their wrong specifications? If you do, for, for example, function contracts in something like from a C, then on the one hand, they do, you do conjunction of host conditions, and then you may do different behaviors. So you can put things into this junction that way uh, and explore all the things that have been sort of uh, talked about uh, recently. But uh, if you do it in from a C, then students can find out that the code that they think is correct doesn't actually satisfy the specification that they put there yep. and see the consequences of their specification. Do you let yep. students see the consequences before they get marked? Yeah, I think these are all perfectly, uh, this is a perfectly reasonable question. I mean, part of this has to do with the pedagogic context and what their prior preparation is. Uh, we actually have a kind of complicated setting in our department uh, which is both a good and a bad thing. Uh, most universities, most departments tend to have the introductory course or the introductory sequence, uh, especially at research universities. They don't want to spend a lot of time on introductory computing. They want to spend it on advanced computing. Um, we're a sort of unusual research university where we actually have four different introductory sequences that all lead you into the major. Uh, what that unfortunately means is that the th interface you can assume between these is somewhat thin. Um, so, you know, my class is much more formal. There are two classes that are more formal. Third is even more formal. The fourth is extremely not very formal. It's sort of like build games in Java and then, you know, do some stuff after that. And then sort of you have to bring them into a more formal setting. So I think partly it's an artifact of having students coming from lots of different backgrounds. So we can't assume that all of them have been accustomed. In fact, Tim's class, Logic for Systems, is the first place where many of them actually see the idea of programming, writing programs alongside some sort of formal method. So, you know, uh, from a C might be one, you know, in his case, he uses Daphne sometimes, right? So, so but the idea that you can have this, this richer property-based proof assistant that's constantly running alongside your program and giving you insight into what's going on, uh, that's something they, many of them actually see for the first time really in that class. So we're trying to move that earlier into the curriculum. But um, culturally, I think uh, uh, there's not a lot of, uh, uh, in, the U in the American system, you tend not to start like extremely formal from uh, early on. Uh, and that maybe, you know, maybe our uh, European versus American cultural differences or something like that, right? Uh, I don't know. So, so I think there are lots of different possibilities. Uh, this is an artifact of some consequences of uh, curriculum design, but uh, I still, I, I, I still find, you know, the thing is I'm able to do this. I think this is important to emphasize. I'm able to do this property-based testing approach before, I mean, in week four of an ac accelerated, but still it's really think like week eight of the introductory course, right? Long before I would have started showing them any sort of like very formal style of programming, right? So, so I think there is there are trade-offs and I'm not saying that there's anything wrong or one should not use these more formal programming methods. I think that's actually a very good idea, but I think there's actually value to just thinking about this from the perspective of testing, which is a universal thing that students don't really question. Does that make sense? Yep, thank you. Cool, thank, thank you Wolfram.
Um, uh, Nikhil, I see you have a question, but I see also uh, Joao. So why don't I take Nikhil and then Joao's question? Joao, I know I see your question. I'll get to it. Nikhil, go ahead, please. Uh, yes, my question is uh, so about sort of completeness and precision, which is that <laughs> yes. when you when you're when you're talking when you're trying to teach this. In some sense, it's a meta level question. How do you specify the specification without giving yep. it away? Yeah. Right? So in other words, you're telling students, I want you to think about this problem. I want to come up with a solution, a specification, a program, and a proof that the program is correct, et cetera. Well, every student can come up with a different program and a different specification. Now, all of them may be right, but they may yeah. not have been the one you were thinking of when you specified, when you yeah. uh, gave the assignment. So how, how, do you, uh, <laughs> how do you constrain it to, to be the target to be this what you want it to be. Great, great question. Um, of course, I'm particularly excited by this question because I have a PhD student who's just finishing his dissertation on this topic. Um, this is a question that's not specific to formal methods, right? We, let's agree on this because this is true of a programming problem as well, right? Yes. I give out a programming problem. And actually there's a very important pedagogic issue there too, because I give out a, you know, what, what typically happens in a programming class is you give out a pro programming problem, the students go off and, you know, come up with a solution, they turn it in, and then a week later, they get some auto grade or feedback saying, uh, they get a grade saying, actually, you didn't quite get it right, you actually solved the wrong problem, here's 70%. Right, So it's more demoralizing for the student, but it also has the difficulty that you created that programming problem with some learning objective in mind. You wanted them to wrestle with some aspect of that task. And by not solving that problem and solving a different problem, they actually have not gotten that learning that you intended for them to get. Now, why might they solve the wrong problem? Turns out there's actually a fair bit of research showing that in the programming case, students routinely solve the wrong problem. Um, like sometimes over 30% or so, I think of some of them in some of the papers that I've seen, um, they solve the wrong problem and there's lots of good reasons for it. They misread the problem statement. They misunderstand the problem statement. They also recall a different problem that they saw. This is there's some cognitive science grounding for this, where they, they saw some problem in class. You put something on the homework that sounds similar enough. They think, oh, I think maybe he meant that problem. And it's sometimes it's subconscious, right? It's not they're consciously thinking that. They just recall this problem from class and that's the thing that they solve. So, what can we do about this? So this is a more universal problem than just thinking about formal methods, okay? Um, what we've been doing is saying, well, let's have students test. I mean, so, so a different way to look at this is we put a lot of emphasis into understanding programs, right? Uh, testing, formal methods, et cetera. This is all about understanding programs. Why don't we put some more emphasis into understanding the problem, different pro word, right? Um, how do we make sure students have understood the problem before they start writing the program for that problem? Because the additional difficulty is students, uh, I like to say students are like 3D printers. They work only by additive manufacturing, right? Once they've written code, they will not unwrite the code. They, the solution to bad code is to write more code because clearly that's what got them there. Surely more code is the solution. And you all know this experience where eventually the student walks into your office and there's a giant mess of code and you're like, oh no, but they'll never throw it away. Right? So we want to make sure they're on the right path before they even start to code. So what we've been using is examples as a way of testing their understanding of the problem. Okay? So they write concrete examples. Now we need a syntax for concrete examples. Guess what? Unit testing is a really good syntax for concrete examples. But we're not doing unit testing yet because they don't have a program to test. Rather, they, they write these unit tests as a way of exploring the problem space and we give them a collection of good and bad implementations. So think of it like kind of mutation testing, but for problem understanding, right? So the bad programs all correspond to misconceptions that they have. So they have to pass the good program. It's a classifier, right? Again, back to this idea of classifier. They classify the good program as good. They classify the bad programs as bad. The bad programs cover the standard misconceptions. So as long as they don't have those misconceptions, now they're sort of free to go off and do it. And in fact, one of our uh, papers, we've built this programming environment that does this. And one of the papers actually shows that students will voluntarily do this before they write the program. You don't have to force them. There's a little bit of like, you know, behavioral nudging in the implementation, but they could start writing code and they choose not to. The vast majority of them actually choose to do this. If you gamify it a little bit, they'll actually explore the problem before they write code. We are now starting to do the same thing for formal methods. We've been taking the same idea and having them write concrete examples of the problem against this, against again, good and bad specifications as a way of making sure that they've understood the problem specification correctly before they go off and start to write a formal model of the system. 
Okay, uh, that's actually work in progress. We're doing a collaboration. Uh, we're actually now also working with the uh, Alloy for Fun folks out in uh, Porto, and uh, Cesare Tinelli has also been playing with these ideas. So we've got like this uh, nice uh, sort of international collaboration going where we're taking this idea out of Brown and trying to do this in formal methods. And we're starting to actually literally the, in the next two hours, I'm going to be looking at the uh, first round of data from this, a second round of data from this. We're starting to get some data to understand what's working and what's not working about this process as we take all the ideas we've learned for programming education and moving into formal methods education. Does that make sense, uh, Nikhil? Does that answer your question? Yeah, thanks. Thank you. Okay, so let me just read our Joao's uh, question here. Uh, I'm unable to use microphone, no problem, but I'd like to ask if you know whether students keep using PBT after attending your class. That is a great question. Um, we actually are trying to do some longitudinal studies on this. Uh, we have not yet done them, so that is a great question. Uh, part of the question is, is there also, you know, it's a little difficult to answer this question directly, and here's why. Um, so there's an easy thing we can do, right? We can go look at subsequent classes and see whether there's even an opportunity for them to do it. But what students do is as much a cultural thing Right. If they have a collection of TAs who say, oh, just write a few tests, the testing part is not that important, they're kind of not going to do it. Right. So you need to sort of have a sweeping reform throughout the curriculum to re-emphasize these topics. So I suspect, I'll be very honest, I suspect that we find that it drops off quite a bit. What I'm more interested in is um, their ability to recall. Like, when they are presented with a, a property-based testing kind of problem, like what I call a relational problem, for example, do they recognize it as a relational problem? And are they able to recall the technique that they use for dealing with it? That to me is like the more important thing because at least it means like the idea got planted firmly enough in their head that it hasn't left their consciousness, right? I suspect we'll find some amount of recall, not as much as we would hope. Uh, but I think I'm more interested in the recall question or the recognition question than I am in the actual practice because that's a very cultural kind of question. Zhang, I hope that makes sense to you as, a, as an answer. Um, I'll wait for Zhang. Uh, yeah, great, thank you. Okay, any other questions or comments, thoughts, observations, experiences you'd like to share related to what I talked about? Uh, yes, uh, please uh, go ahead, Aditya. Uh, I want to ask, you, uh, in your slide there, uh three, uh, sorry, uh, I gotta start the video. Three, three causes, in, uh, yes. the Delta Re immediate and advanced. So in every year, there's a cost related to formal methods, right? Uh, so formal methods, it's uh, one of the main learning objective for the undergraduate department. And how many portion of the Courses related to formal methods. What do you think about the curriculum? Thank you. Yeah, yeah. No, so let me be, let me represent that a little more clearly. So the introductory class that does it is only my introductory class, which is one of, as I said, four different parts of the sequence. But we're taking, trying to take this idea to more part, more of the introductory sequences. I'm hoping that eventually, uh, based on some curriculum reforms we're doing, uh, so my colleague, Kathy Fizzler, who some, some of you may actually know, in the 1990s, there was a formal methods education repository hosted at Indiana. And that was actually hosted by my wife, uh, wife and colleague, Kathy Fizzler. So, so, uh, so, so it's interesting to see this idea reviving and I'm delighted. And so is she, by the way, so she said, uh, great to see this happening again. So uh, she's actually teaching uh, the, the, uh, another sort of another pinch point in the curriculum. And she's trying to put some of the property-based testing ideas in there. So we're hoping that by in about a year or two, all the students will have seen some of this idea in the introductory sequence. The intermediate level, there's again, a, a weird peculiarity of the Brown curriculum is there's no required course everybody is supposed to take. So there's choices everywhere. So at the, sec at the intermediate level, only some of them will have seen it through Tim. Um, we do not require any courses. So formal methods is not a required class. Um, Tim's class is now taken by about a third to a half of all of the majors in the department. Uh, but every course is optional. Uh, there are requirements of you know, kinds of courses you have to take, but no one course is required. So um, I think, uh, you know, uh, it's a little bit of an overrepresentation. say formal methods is a major emphasis, uh, but we're getting more of the, more of it into the curriculum. Uh, but Tim's class is taken by about a third to a half of the students. So in, in as much as third to half see it, they will see it. That, does that make sense, Aditya? Does that answer your question? Yes, yes. so uh, optional, but many students took it. 
Right. And, and I, think part, I think it's, uh, the fact that it's optional is, I think, a very healthy thing, right? It okay. forces us to design the class in a way that will appeal to a broad range of students. And, and you might say, ah, of course, you just have to make the class easy. Uh, I'm very happy to say that doesn't work in my department. We actually get fat course evals if the class is too easy. Uh, students don't like uh, courses that kind of waste their time and they go tend to gravitate towards courses that are actually going to teach them something. So, so we can't do it by making it easy. We have to make it hard and rigorous, but we have to make it sort of appealing. It has to like make them think like, why would I want to take this class? Did I learn something from taking this class? And so designing for that other 90% is like the principle that gets us there. Does that make sense? Thank you. Thank yes. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Benedict, please. Uh, yeah, at the end of your presentation, you mentioned the uh, like state of evaluating uh, teaching as being very bad. Yeah. So where would you start if one wants to do more empirical evaluation That's of a good teaching? Question. Maybe not with the goal of publishing education papers, but just improving one's own teaching. Exactly. I think that's a great question. Um, I will say that there's a, a decent resource. Um, the, uh, two years ago, there was a new handbook of uh, computing education research that came out of Cambridge University Press. Uh, uh, in fact, Kathy Fisler and I wrote one of the chapters in there. I will not say that all of the chapters are uniformly excellent. Uh, I won't say about our own. You can decide for yourself. Um, <laughs> but I think some of the chapters are much better than others. Um, uh, but uh, generally, the quality is fairly decent. And it gives you a good understanding of the landscape of computing education research. So I think you'll find that some of the chapters you may, I mean, each cha each person is going to be appeal, find different chapters appealing, right? You know, some people may care more about chapters on equity. Some people may care more about chapters on programming languages, about a, a misconceptions and so on. But I think if nothing else, um, the, the PL chapter was, we specifically wrote with pointers to lots of open questions, but also with the pointers to lots of things that we know from the literature. Uh, sorry, uh, Yuli, I will type it in here. It's the... Uh, uh, actually, Elijah, do you mind just looking it up and maybe pasting a URL into it, the Cambridge Handbook? I think you know the chap the book I'm talking about, so you can find it. Uh, maybe uh, paste the Cambridge URL or something like that. Uh, that would be definitive. Um, and, and also the name, please, Elijah. So, uh, and then there's also chapters on things like misconceptions, and then you can go look in there and uh, find uh, how people have thought about misconceptions and programming for a while now. Uh, there's some on like maybe more cognitive foundations and so on. So I think that may be a good starting point for lack of sort of a better uh, definitive. I, I mean, of course it's a big handbook, but you, as I said, you will not probably care about most of the chapters. At least you can prioritize which ones you want to read. Does that maybe help as a starting point? Uh, you think? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I mean, it's better than I think individual papers. And frankly, uh, I don't want to make a universal statement, but I don't think there are very many papers I've seen that I say, I would say meet like a rigorous standard of uh, computing education research for assessing curricula in formal methods. So, and I would love to be told who the, uh, except what the exceptions are, because I'm, I'm uh, you know, I, I'd love to read these and get to know the people better, but uh uh, so yeah, I, I think your, your perspective here, uh, uh, Benedict, is also a really healthy one, right? It's not so much about writing papers, but you know, these are techniques I use in my own class. And in fact, I, I, there's this funny thing that happens in my courses, right? I say, look, a course is, you know, we're going to be kind of doing experiments on you. And some of my students are like, wait, what? You're going to do experiments on me? Like, look, every course is an experiment, right? Every course, whether we like it or not, it's a, there's a hypothesis. I think if I teach it this way, it'll be better. And if I teach it that way, it'll be worse. And then based on my insight, I go off and I do something and I say, let me try teaching it this way instead. So what is missing? So we're already halfway to the scientific method in the way we do our courses. What's missing is closing that loop, right? Is asking a priori, well, what would it mean if I, if I did this better or did this worse? Like what outcome would I expect to see? And actually see, taking that outcome seriously and evaluating it, that's often the part that's missing, right? We have this sort of very anecdotal and maybe three students come and tell us they really liked it and we feel good about it and that's good. We should feel good. But Pulling, tying that knot a little more tightly, that's the part that's often missing, right? And then sharing back some of that, some of that stuff uh, with, with the community through things like FMT and so on. I think it would be great if we could do that. Other questions or comments? Okay, I, I see also that uh, I think there's an hour limit on this and uh, uh, Luigi, I think we're cutting close to that hour, so maybe uh, yeah, yeah. It's I, uh, to stop at this point. 
we, we will stop soon, yes. Uh, I also have uh, other questions as yes. well, but uh, maybe <clears throat> I will uh, send them to you via email. I just wanted to comment one thing. You mentioned this um, dichotomy of problem versus program. And I just wanted to say that um, I've heard, uh, well, not only there, but I've heard the, the concept in uh, Carol Morgan's. Uh, he has a course called Informal uh, Methods, in which uh -huh, he's uh -huh. teaching uh, from the first year, students uh, that just joined the university, he's teaching yep. uh, programming yep. with invariance and properties. Right, and right. Uh, he just calls it programming. <laughs> so it's right, just right, of uh, incorporating yeah. from the beginning. So. Right. I think, uh, and it's not the only example. I have, uh, sure, I have sure. uh, encountered encountered others, and I think it's, it's it's where where we might go. I mean, I'm quite optimistic when I'm thinking about this. If you teach people from the beginning that that's the way to do it, then uh, in your case with uh, properties from the beginning and think about the problem <laughs> before putting right. it into code. I, I think Maybe. you know, I, I've 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 seen Carol. I, I know Carol well. He's he's inspiring. He's fantastic. Um, I, I do think that there is a sense in which uh, we have this conception that if we do something from the beginning, it will stick. And in some sense, that is the question that Joao was asking, like, does it actually stick? We don't know that, right? We like to think that and we believe this. And I think uh, I, I'm going to go out on a limb a little bit and say, I think the formal methods community in particular has this uh, the formal-ish people, right? And I'm including some of my programming language community and so on in this. We have this belief system that if we can grab students early and we show them this stuff early and then that will like mold their perception for the rest of it and then they will do what we wanted. And we don't have evidence that that's actually true, right? Uh, and one can argue that certainly industrial practice does not seem to reflect that yet. So, so I think we need to be, you know, and unless we assess this, and this is really good to the point I made at the end, unless we assess, we won't know. And if we don't know, then we might be deluding ourselves. Right? But if we assess and we find what is working and what's not working, then we can put in place like the practices that would enable each other to like, you know, we have to build up this body of knowledge based on research rather than just belief. Um, but I think also we're in a very interesting point in time, right? I spend a lot of time looking at programming blogs and seeing what programmers write on Twitter and things like that. And there's actually, I think, a very healthy signal because the, the gap between what felt like an unbridgeable gap when I was a grad student, right? Like going to a programmer and saying, you should use formal methods. It's like, what are you even talking about, right? They were struggling to like get from C to C++ or something. It was like, a, it was a different universe. There's now, I think the future is much more, you know, People are actually interested. Now, of course, when I say people, we might be talking about tens of thousands out of millions of programmers, right? So it may be still a small population, but when you start getting some of these people in each company and they start spreading the word within their company and so on, I think there's a huge opportunity right now, right? Part of the reason I'm doing this property-based testing thing is because P developers are starting to recognize the value of property-based testing. Developers who discover it, you'll see blogs where they write a blog post where they say, here's property-based testing. Here's this really cool thing that I just found out, right? And, and it's making me build software better. And then other developers believe developers. They're not going to believe us as professors, but they're going to believe each other as developers. So building up our infrastructure for educating people in this stuff right now, I think is very timely because there's potentially a huge audience for the sort of thing as it in the next five to 10 years, right? And we should be build, playing for that long game. How can we educate people in the, in the next five to 10 years on this sort of thing? Yeah. So, so I want to end on this very inspiring note. I think the yes. time is ripe and formal methods is finally coming into its own. And uh, if we do things the right way, we can have huge impact that we've always wanted to have. And we know we can have, we have the material for it. We just haven't made the educational bridge. And that's why this event is so important. Exactly. <laughs> Yeah. Thank you so much, Riram. Thank you so it much. Thank you, everybody, for coming. And... Uh, I see so many friends still on here. Uh, you know, I see uh, Kenichi and Haniel and all sorts of other uh, wonderful people who I haven't seen in a long time. So thank you all for coming. I really appreciate it. Thanks for your time. Thank you very much. We will put the, the, the talk uh, online as soon as uh, we can, and uh, you can uh, come back to it and ask uh, Shuram more. <laughs> please do. Looking email. forward to hearing from you. Thank you Let's all. Let's keep in Bye -bye. touch. Thank you very much. Indeed, Bye. please. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.